when inflammation is turned on, that will turn on the uh, the synthesis and the accumulation of a highly bioactive lipid or type of fat within the sphingolipid family called ceramides. And when ceramides accumulate, they will directly antagonize the insulin signal, making the cell less responsive to insulin. So if you were to start imagining a sequence of events, which I like to do um, and like to teach as a professor, you could imagine if we're looking at uric acid on one end and then insulin resistance on the other, insulin resistance being the single most common health disorder worldwide and increasing the risk of virtually every chronic disease. So it is something worth focusing on. Then between the uric acid and the insulin resistance, the bridge, the great mediator is inflammation. And then it would be ceramides and then it would be insulin resistance. So it is, it's worth wondering then um, how important is the inflammation? And it is massively important. So uric acid will increase systemic inflammation. So inflammation is occurring throughout the body rather than inflammation coming from a wound or a general infection. It increases the systemic inflammation by activating pathways like the NLRP3 inflammasome. Now, anytime you hear that word, that suffix ohm, it means it's a kind of broad encompassing thing. And so with inflammasome, it's basically referring to this NLRP3, you could imagine it as this big central switch that when it's turned on, power throughout all of these other circuits is being turned on. So when NLRP3 is turned on, it's activating countless other inflammatory signals. So it's really at a nexus that when it gets activated, a lot of things will follow or a lot of things will be turned on as a consequence of that one. And again, uric acid will turn that on. And then there was a good study by Zhu, Z-H-U et al., Zhu et al. in 2014, and we'll have this link in the show notes, um, that is that really explored this and found that uric acid was capable of very rapidly causing insulin resistance. And then there were there was a substantial inflammatory burden that was a part of that response. And indeed, I would say an essential part of the response. That if you, to, to be very precise about it, if you block the inflammation, you block the insulin resistance. So in other words, uric acid is only causing insulin resistance in the cells or the body because of its effect on inflammation. Um, so that's that's an effect. In fact, I'll get to some of my own research in a moment that we're about to publish where I can solidify some of those, some of that signal and that sequence of events. All right. Now, where does uric acid come from? At this point, you understand generally what uric acid is, this molecule in the blood that has the potential to both crystallize together, causing gout, or just activate inflammation signals. You have a better understanding of why that matters in the context of insulin resistance, which we're going to revisit when we talk about solutions to this. Um, but then let's move on now to discussing where does uric acid come from. I mentioned this right early on, describing or mentioning the origins coming from the purines. So as I said, as a as a term of chemistry, so pardon the term getting the terms getting a little technical. Um, but purines are what's con what's called nitrogenous bases that are used as the building blocks of nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. So of course you've heard of DNA. When you start to think about the genetics of every cell on the planet, purines are going to be a part of this. Um, so every animal, every plant, you're, the purines are an essential component within the nucleic acids that make up all of our DNA and then the, the central dogma of cell biology. So the idea of what makes our genetics become our body that flow of genetic information, boy, the purines and the nucleic acids are just critical to that process. Now, why or how can this become a problem? The, the conventional thinking with uric acid, still conventional and certainly historical, would be, is, is that foods that are high in purines where you're eating a lot of purines require the body to metabolize and clear a lot of purines and, and, and thus giving rise to more uric acid, which um, through a pathway I'll get into in just a moment. But foods like this particularly results in the vilification of things like red meat and seafood, 
red meat and fish tend to have a higher purine load. And thus the idea is that if you eat more of those purine rich foods, your body has to deal with them um, as a course of breaking it down. If you have more purines than you need, um, uh, than the body needs, you're breaking them down. So when you start to break down the purines, um, then they, it gives rise to a molecule called xanthine. And as xanthine is metabolized, as you continue to clear these molecules and break them down, at the end of it then, as xanthine is acted on by its enzyme, it turns into uric acid. That's, that's one of the products. So it is, you eat it, you metabolize it, and it gets turned into uric acid. That and that can certainly happen. Now, the conventional view is that is not only the conventional view is that that is the only thing that happens, but also that it is certainly the most important, even if someone is considering that there might be another cause. But now let's talk about that other cause.